Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Wager Talk podcast. Divisional round weekend in the NFL weekend of January 13th and 14th. And we're going to take a look at all four divisional round playoff games on tonight's show and take a look at three top 25 key matchups in Saturday's college baskets. Of course, I'm Scott Spritzer with Marco D'Angelo and Dave Koken. But before we do all that, as always, we jump behind the counter at CGT Sportsbooks with Matthew Holt earlier today on the Las Vegas Sports Line on ESPN Las Vegas. Dave Koken and I had a chance to get the latest betting handle numbers on this week's playoff matchups. Hey, Matthew Holt, what's going on, big guy? Hey, gentlemen, how are we doing today? Hey, man. Well, I'm looking forward to the weekend. It's going to be fun, and uh, we're not going to waste any time. We're going to head right behind the counter right now for the latest wagering news on the four playoff matchups, and we'll begin with a game that apparently we're seeing some movement now on this game, the Atlanta Falcons and the Philadelphia Eagles. What's happening there? But this is an interesting game here because everybody jumped on the two and a half right out of the gate here on the Atlanta Falcons thinking that this thing could go three, three and a half, even four. I heard some people asking me, do you think it'll be four by kickoff? Right now, CG Technology still Atlanta Falcons minus two and a half, minus 120. Despite the fact that at this point, overwhelmingly fairly one-sided action both over the counter and on account on the Atlanta Falcons. What we're not seeing interestingly in this game is the big bets from the sharp players. Biggest bet on this game so far, just 10K, which for an NFL playoff game, despite the fact that it's only Thursday, still really low. This is the lowest handle game of the week, yet everyone's talking about it. Sharps don't want to seem to get involved yet. I keep hearing they're coming on Philly, maybe because we're two and a half. They're not playing it with us, but you know, right now, four times more dollars wagered on Atlanta overall, both on account and over the counter, but not the handle you'd expect for an NFL playoff game. I kept thinking, Matt, at three, I don't care, but at two and a half, less than three, that this Atlanta Falcon, or excuse me, Philadelphia Eagles side uh, might be a part of a, of a teaser here and there at, you know, teasing it up to eight and a half, nine and a half, but uh, I guess that remains to be seen. Titans at New England, the Patriots, they were 13 and a half when we spoke to Jason Symbol yesterday, down another half point to 13. Now, boy, it's tough to go against this New England team that covers every spread, including eight of their last ten as double-digit chalk, and they did it again last year in the playoffs as double-digit chalk to the Houston Texans. Yeah, absolutely, and this is our one and only and uh, pros versus Joes game of the week right now, and it is a big-time pros versus Joes. Uh, as look, as about 92% of the dollars wagered over the counter on the New England Patriots yet 93% of the dollars wagered on account on the Tennessee Titans. And we just took another 10K bet today on the Tennessee Titans money line, plus 750, 10K to make 75K. Uh, That to go along with, we had already taken several thousand dollars on Tennessee Titans money line. We're all the way down to uh, plus 650 now. Look, if Tennessee was to win this game outright right now, that, that would be the single biggest liability that we have. Uh, in the NFL this weekend. A game I bet right away, uh, basically, was the Jags and Steelers, thinking I better get it now before the line goes nuts in the game. Well, the line hasn't gone nuts in the game, despite the fact that the Steelers seem to be getting healthier by the minute. Uh, But but that line's still sitting around seven, so what's going on in that matchup? Big liability for us here, and thank goodness we started to take some Jacksonville Jaguars money today, or we would have been headed to seven and a half as well. 97% 97% of dollars wagered over the counter on the Pittsburgh Steelers. Not a big surprise there as so many fans bet what their eyes saw last and what they saw last from Blake Bortles in this Jacksonville offense was not very pretty. Uh, and it's a revenge spot, of course, for Pittsburgh after Big Ben throwing the five interceptions the first time these two teams played earlier in the season. Look, we had overwhelming one-sided action on account on the Pittsburgh Steelers earlier today. Took a tuple, couple of 20K bets on Jacksonville. Things a lot more evened out now, about one and a half times as much dollars wagered on Pittsburgh on account as Jacksonville and the Jaguars, certainly making up a lot of ground on the sharp side on account so far, but this one was really one-sided, was our biggest liability this morning, starting to even out, especially by the sharper players on account. Just a little tidbit on this one. Earlier today, Le'Veon Bell has to, for some reason, right before a playoff game, comes out and says that if Pittsburgh puts the franchise tag on him, he might retire. You know, and, and I'm thinking, why do you do this? He's 25 years old, and I'm just, the timing just blows me away sometimes. 
on, on some of the things that are said. Right going into a playoff game, you got to tell them that you're going to challenge them well, if, he if runs, they put the franchise tag on you. He's, uh, maybe he'll make a deal where he runs for 240 yards and that's what he ought to do. They ought to say, yeah, you run for 240 and we won't put the there franchise. You there you go. Perfect. See, that's why you ought to be behind the. Uh, you ought to be in the office right now with the Steelers going into this game. I love incentives. There you go. Saints of the Vikings, uh, Matt. I saw you guys run those Vikings up to five and a half total, 46. And I know Jason told us yesterday that you guys took a max bet on Minnesota, forcing that number up a little bit at the time. Yeah, and what's interesting about this game is that it, this one felt like it would probably be a pros versus Joes, too. We thought we were going to get um, some public money on the Saints here. Plenty of good reasons to have public money on the Saints. Number one in the entire NFL in yards per play, 6.3 yards per play. Have a lot of momentum, a Hall of Fame quarterback, a great, well-known head coach. Hasn't been the case here, although it's starting to even up a little bit over the counter. Still two times more dollars wagered on the Minnesota Vikings over the counter and three and a half times as much dollars wagered on the Minnesota Vikings on account. So surprisingly here, we're fairly one-sided all on the Vikings. We did take a $15,000 bet uh, about an hour ago on the Saints money line at plus 210, which helped a little bit. But um, for a game that I thought you could really make a strong case for both teams, the action so far has been a lot more one-sided on the home team than I anticipated. And that was Matt Holt earlier today on the Las Vegas Sports Line right here on ESPN Las Vegas. When we come back, we're going to break down all four playoff games from the betting side of the counter. Stick around. It's Manic Monday, and that means every pick at wagertalk.com is just $9. Get a play in any sport valued at up to $30 for just $9 each and every Monday at wagertalk.com. Welcome back to Wager Talk Podcast, weekend of January 13th and 14th. NFL action. We've got the Falcons at the Eagles kicking things off on Saturday. The Falcons, three in some books, still two and a half at CGT, as we heard from Matt Holt a little bit earlier. A total right around 41 and a half. And Marco, the huge adjustment, obviously, to the line with Wentz out. Nick Foles gets that extra motivation for what it's worth of knowing he's leading the only top seeded home team to ever be installed as an underdog in the divisional round. I had Atlanta over the Rams last week. Probably 60% of that play was based on the Rams' inexperience and also their inefficiencies at home all season long. They were just 50-50 at home this year, and that led to that play. Not sure I'm so excited about backing the Falcons this week. What are your thoughts? Well, obviously, the public is going to look at it and see that the Falcons went to L.A. and they're going to look at it and say, hey, they shut down the league's top offense. Highest scoring offense in the NFL this year. They hold them to 13 points. But as you alluded to and us that were on Atlanta looking at that game, we thought Jared Goff, until he showed us that he could do it in the playoffs, you know, you got to prove it. And it's the stat now. Um, Last week I did a podcast with uh, Dr. Bob, and he brought out a stat on first-time quarterbacks in the playoffs after last week's action, that stat's now 16-29 and 29 against the spread. A little asterisk to it, though. There was one win and one loss in the same game last week because you had Tyrod Taylor and Blake Bortles. Somebody had to win sure. against the spread and somebody had to lose. But uh, still, it shows the fact that first-time quarterbacks don't do well. I'm not sold on Atlanta. I know that uh, this is a team that at the beginning of the year – you know, they came out of the gate 3-0, and and then it's like they just started looking to that New England game. And then after, the, you know, they had a couple bad games. Second halves have always been a problem for them. But then they caught fire at the end of the season. But if you go back and look at their record on the road this year, although they are 6-3 and three on the road, mm-hmm. they're just 3-6 and six against the spread on the road. And we talk about such a huge difference in the line here, the number one seed being a home underdog. Call me old school. I got to look at this one. I got to take the home dog. I know me and you talked Sunday night. We were texting back and forth. And when this line was sitting at the two and a half, now there are a lot of threes around town. um, I said automatically, I said, I'm teasing Philadelphia. Now, the math says when it's three, Three, we're not supposed to do that. But you know what? I Well, the math also said play the Cleveland Browns every week for the past (laughs) two years. You know, so so here's where I want to take this. They're the number one seed only, and from a technical standpoint, they aren't the number one seed. Okay, they're not even close to the number one seed. They're more like the number eight seed, and there are only six teams in each conference, which tells you mm-hmm. something. They, and I don't. I think they've lost their confidence. I heard Lane Johnson talking this week, the, the uh, All Pro tackle, mm-hmm. and 
it kind of cracked me up when I saw the comments. We, we like the idea that nobody's given us a chance that, that uh, uh, you know, everybody thinks we're, uh, we're going to get beat. We prefer that. So you prefer that to when everybody thought you were the best team in the league yep. and you were kicking the snot out of teams on a weekly basis. That is kind of humorous. Lane, <laughs> I, I think you're full of crap, okay? Yeah. I think they've lost their confidence. I don't think they believe in Nick Foles at all. And I think it's impacting every aspect of the team. It also means the defense is spending more time in the field and is therefore getting exploited. The negatives here, are uh, there are some negatives on the Atlanta side. I mean, Hell look, yeah. they, had, they had to play last week on the road. Now they got to travel all the way back. Playing, It's not going to be bad weather, but it's not going to be great. It's going to be cold. And they're a dome team. Um, and, you know, the Falcons haven't exactly had the most consistent year in the world. Uh, uh, but and, and that might keep me out of the game. But I can't play Philadelphia, and I know the numbers guys are going to see. Well, well i, I got to tell you something. It's not based on the last thing I saw. It's based on the last three things I've seen since Nick, since Nick Foles had to step in for Carson Wentz. And that is that this team might be a full two touchdowns worse without Foles, who was going to win the MVP. He was going to win the MVP. Mm-hmm. And this guy, who had one good season and he had one great game where he threw seven touchdown passes and he is strictly a backup quarterback. For me, it's Atlanta or nothing, so it's probably going to be nothing because I do respect the scheduling dynamics. One thing you mentioned about coming back from the West Coast last week, not only that bad situation on Atlanta, this is actually their fourth road game in five weeks. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that because I forgot all about it. Yeah, yeah, four road games in five weeks and then do the old West Coast, East Coast shuffle here. You know, it's... It's going to be, a, you know, it's hard to take Philadelphia. It's one of those ones, like we say, you know, you go to the window and hold your nose. But uh, I'm not sold on the Falcons, and it's not a team that's been offensively scoring a lot of points. They struggle to put points on the board this year. I had one side last week at wagertalk.com. That was the Atlanta Falcons. I just thought it was a terrific spot. And still, they had that, they jump out to the lead. I even tweeted out at one point. They're not even going to wait till twenty-eight to three to blow this one. You know, I mean, it was it was it was looking bad. They were looking like they were about ready to lose that game to the Rams after dominating the fact early. They didn't will help them. What's that? The fact they finally I didn't. Guess. They've had yeah, a lot I mean, of fourth maybe. quarter melts, and this time they didn't. I'm just I can't lay the points, no. and especially at a field goal, I can't I can't do it. I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Titans at New England. That's the other Saturday game, the late game. Uh, as we heard earlier from Matt, this line had dropped from you know fourteen early in the week down to thirteen and a half. Down to 13 on Thursday afternoon. Total 47 and a half. And Dave, I didn't play the Titans Chiefs game last week. Uh, Casey, though, man, you knew what I was talking about from doing radio since before the season. I thought this team was overvalued, overrated. I guess it's become their thing. They win by every means, you know, necessary outside of traditional play uh, to get to 10 wins or 11 wins a year. And then they can't go anywhere in the playoffs. The defensive metrics were horrible all year for KC. So I'm caught on how much credit do we give Tennessee? I'll give him some. I mean, Mariota played a good football game. He used his legs. Derrick Henry was absolutely sensational last week uh, as the only running back. And that'll be the situation again this week. Against DeMarco a Murray. bad Kansas City yep. defense. DeMarco <laughs> Murray's been ruled out for this game. So it's, yeah. it's going to be the same guy, Henry. Uh, and uh, Mariota did a really nice job finding guys over the middle. He still can't throw an out pass. It's outside the numbers. Just, it they sails. just have to take it yep. out of the playbook because he cannot throw the pass. Yep. Um, and that, by the way, is something, if he doesn't fix that, he'll never become a great quarterback. You've got to be able to make all the throws, and that's a throw he can't make. <laughs> but the rest of his game, pretty good last week. Uh, it takes some of the heat off Malarkey. I, you know, you got to think he'll survive now that they won a playoff game. Sure. The Patriots, though, are, you know, it's, it's New England, and it's January, and the game's in Foxborough. And you want to go against that? <laughs> Not me. Um, they're gonna, they've, they've priced me out of the game. I don't want to lay two touchdowns or thereabouts. And, uh, but, they, you know, the thing is, the Patriots, weren't they in a similar situation last year? Yeah. And the line was right around the same they thing. And Houston. They just yeah. beat the snot out of Houston. 35 16, 34 16. Yeah. yeah it was, you know, so the same thing could happen here. The Patriots will keep on scoring. I think, it, my opinion, if you like the Titans in this game, take them first half. If you like New England in the game, big line or not, or not, I'd probably take a full game. I'm not going to do anything with this one. There's, there's a game I like a lot this weekend, but this isn't it. Marco, let me ask you this, and then we'll jump into your analysis. Isn't Kansas City, or don't they look, or didn't they look, like a team that if they knew how to win playoff games, they win that game last week. That team doesn't know how to win playoff games. Alex Smith doesn't. The guys around him don't. They're up 21-3. to 
They get one guy hurt, Travis Kelsey, and all of a sudden the offense collapses. I know there were some adjustments made by the Titans. That's Kansas City's game to win, and they they piss it away. Well, it's Andy Reid. I, I mean, I still – that's the big difference. If this game's anywhere near 21-3 to again, the difference between Kansas <laughs> City and Andy Reid and Bill Belichick – is Bill Belichick has one gear. His yeah. foot's going to be on the gas the entire game. And he they does. can lose Gronk, and they're still going to win. Yeah. <laughs> this is, to three. You know, I can't trust, you know, laying points with Kansas City, uh, with Andy Reid and his conservative nature, but that's not going to be the case this week. They ran the football for 202 yards last week, Tennessee. Do you really think they're going to get 200 yards <laughs> against the Patriots? We all talked about the Patriots that first month of the season, how bad the defense was. Well, over the last 12 games of the season, they held 10 of 12 opponents to 17 points or less. This defense did a complete reversal uh, in season. Mm-hmm. The other part of it is you look at um, last week, Tennessee was able to contain Kansas City in the second half. They made adjustments and so forth. And in the first half, Kansas City got the lead and everything. But a lot was talked about Dick LeBeau's defense. Well, Dick LeBeau, let's stop and remember where Dick LeBeau came from. He was in Pittsburgh all those years, and this is a bad memory for me. Every time Dick LeBeau lined up that defense against the New England Patriots, it was the same story over and over. Belichick spread the field, four and five receiver sets, which created mismatches. It put running backs lined up, you know, out against a linebacker. Gronk in mismatches. He's going to do the same thing. It's the same defense, and that's the big key. And Pittsburgh's always had success against Kansas City. So, yeah, LeBeau's defense had some success last week. Not going to have that this week. I think that's a huge factor. A little stat for you, Tennessee, off of an upset the last three seasons. Not that they've had that many underdog outright sure. wins, but they're 0-6 in the next game. And then, of course, the stat that every bookmaker in Las Vegas knows the last two seasons, the New England Patriots, 27-8 and eight against the spread. Yeah. Just pure and simple. Bet them blindly like a weekly ATM machine. And you're in Bora Bora sipping Mai Tais on the beach <laughs> yeah. right now. How about 14-3 and three against the spread against teams with a winning record? Two more for you. 5-1 and one divisional playoff spread run. And this is crazy. They're 8-2 and two against the spread as a double-digit favorite the last 10 times. And as Koken just mentioned, one of those times was in the playoffs last year when they were a double-digit favorite to Houston and covered that one in a 34-16 to 16 win. So, I mean, they just covered the spread. So, for me, it's like not playing on Cleveland. You either play New England or you stay away from the game. Uh, Jags are at the Steelers. Steelers 7 minus Jews 41. And, Mark, I'll start with you on this one. But I'll, I'll begin by saying that, you know, Dave and I, we send back and forth uh, emails on games – basically every night of the week. And when this number came out, we both looked at each other and said, so it's probably going to get up there. It's probably going to get to eight, maybe a little higher. Seven minus juice is kind of where it's locked in. There are some shops that have had seven and a half, but seven minus juice at the, at the major shops. I'm actually shocked at that point because this is one of those ones, and me and you talked also on Sunday night when the lines came out. I said this is going to be a game that is going to be absolutely pounded on teasers, and we know what Vegas does for teaser protection. Once a game is sitting, it's, you know, that seven and a half. Yeah. It's almost a direct <laughs> jump to nine yeah. because they want to stop the teasers. They know where they're coming. And for this to still be sitting at, you know, a few seven and a halfs and a lot of sevens minus 120 out there, who is betting Jacksonville? I want to know. Who... Well, we heard Matt earlier on the show. Everybody, <laughs> they're, they're taking nothing but Pittsburgh bets for the most part. You know, it's but there's got to be some yeah. big yeah, bets some, coming yeah, in that's some, balancing there, the books. There are. Yeah. There are some big bets. Look, it, it's similar. And believe me, I'm not comparing <laughs> the two. Okay, I, I'm just making a point. It's the Browns syndrome. Yeah. Because the Browns get big, they get big, the, the big, you know, the money. Uh, the deep pockets, the, the big bank rolls. Well, yeah. and the, the, the numbers crunchers. Mm-hmm who bet a lot of money uh, based on their numbers, uh, would come in on Cleveland every week. And look, they, they won a lot of games, too. I'm just, I'm, so I'm not making fun of them here with the Browns thing. But they, they're going to be on Jacksonville. I guarantee you the numbers guys are on Jacksonville in this game because the, the metrics in this game indicate it's a close game. And they are going to be on Jacksonville, and I think that's why they're trying to keep them from just unloading and actually creating a liability for them where the books can't win. And you go back to that first game, and everybody's going to point, well, Jacksonville 
you know, beat the snot out of the they Steelers. Did. It was the five interception game. Well, <laughs> I'm a situational guy, and we I know do where you're going here. <laughs> we have that sandwich situation. Yep. You know, we do the sandwich sure. shop all the time. That was the sandwich game of all sandwich games for the Pittsburgh Steelers because they played Baltimore the week before. Their arch rival, which gave them the leg up on the division early in the season. Pittsburgh had a two-game lead because of that win. And they had the undefeated Kansas City Chiefs, who at the time, obviously being undefeated, but everybody was in love with the Chiefs. So it was a clear look-ahead spot, flat game off of Baltimore, look-ahead to... Kansas City, and we did a lot of shows together that mm-hmm. week. We did videos, everything. Every place that I could speak that week, I was saying, this is a horrible spot for the Steelers. I think that was a 5% play for me taking uh, uh, the Jags. No, it wasn't a 5%. But we took the Jags that week. We were, yeah. all, we were all on Jacksonville yeah. that week. It was the spot for them. The five interceptions, yeah, Ben had a bad game. A couple of them were tip balls, uh, so don't get too excited about it. But, guys, down the stretch, the Pittsburgh offense, at the beginning of the season, everybody was saying, oh, it was the defense carrying the team. The offense was struggling. Well, they had all of their problems, Le'Veon Bell's holdout and this and that. But down the stretch, last seven games, five of the seven games, they've scored 28 or more. The two games that they didn't, 23 points on the road, the Monday night game in the rain at Cincinnati, and then – the New England game. Mm-hmm. And we just talked about in the previous game, New England, how good the defense has been. They've held 10 out of 12 teams mm-hmm. to under 17 points. The last point that I'm going to make as far as Pittsburgh goes, you look at them last week, you know, the last two games they've been without Antonio Brown. And I think that moving forward, it's actually going to be a blessing in disguise because the Steelers had to now rely on the other receivers. Now, we know the season that Juju uh, is so having. He's had a, just a tremendous rookie year. But the other guys got involved because they had to. Antonio Brown wasn't there. And guys were making plays. And that's going to give Ben confidence to throw the ball around the field, not always looking for Antonio Brown, which is a great thing to do because he catches everything that comes his way. But he gets double teams. Now all these guys have got experience. There's going to be a lot of guys that are going to be open in single coverage that he's going to have confidence to go to. i got to ask you one question before Dave jumps in here. And I, I toss this out to, I, like you, I, we both do a show on the same uh, station in Phoenix. You do yours yep. on a Saturday, I believe. And I normally do mine on Friday afternoons, but today we did it on Thursday because I'm not going to be able to do the show on Friday. Anyway, uh, it's the Rock and Minute show for those who want to tune in down there. I think it's 1580 or 1560. But anyway, been doing that show for a dozen years. Minute used to play in the NFL. He was mm-hmm. a backup for the Buffalo Bills for a little while. He was a starting quarterback for Kansas State when they were absolutely horrible. I always give a hard time for that. Uh, but Dan Manucci, I asked him, and I said, you know, you sp- and he spent a little bit of time in New England also mm-hmm. as a backup, as a deep backup. But uh, just in case he tunes, he does listen to the podcast once in a while. But I asked him today, I go, what do you make of the fact that Le'Veon Bell is threatening Pittsburgh three days before they play their playoff game? You franchise tag me. I might retire at the age of 25. I'm like, what are you doing, man? If this team wins every game from here on out to the Super Bowl, he's got, what, four more weeks to wait before he has to open his mouth, and he couldn't do it. And I'm sitting there, you know, I asked Manuch, and Manuch was saying, he goes, you know, he goes, if I'm a veteran and I'm bigger than him and I'm in the locker room, he goes, I'm telling him, I'm, I'm probably grabbing him by the jersey and throwing him against the locker, and I'm paraphrasing and add a little bit of exaggeration to this. He goes, but I'm telling him to shut his mouth. Wait till after the season. Yeah. And so I'm asking you, as a Pittsburgh guy, you – follow all the teams, but you really follow the Steelers not only as a better, but also as a a very close fan of the team. Doesn't that bother you just a little bit going into Sunday that Le'Veon Bell is all of a sudden thinking all about himself? Well, obviously he held out the entire preseason, so Mm -hmm. we've already seen where his colors are as far as that goes. Mm -hmm. Um, He's a guy that's, you know, very active on social media, which drives a lot of People in Pittsburgh, crazy. Uh, They say things, you know, in Antonio Brown, you know, both superstars have had their problems where they've done things that they shouldn't have done. Uh, Last year, Antonio Antonio Brown took his uh, phone out in the locker room and did the the live Facebook thing. Real smart. Yeah, yeah, it's... So they've had what you're saying is they've had their issues, issues to get over. They're used we've to had it. drama yeah. all year. If how there was no things, drama, you'd be worried. Yeah, how many? <laughs> the first couple weeks of the season, think about it. They had the national anthem thing. The, the yeah. national anthem. They had Bell's holdout. They had Antonio Brown's 
meltdown on the sidelines with mm-hmm. the Gatorade uh, <laughs> container. And then Ben was, after the Jacksonville yep. game, was retiring. Yes. Right. He was right. done. I can't I mean, do this anymore. Yeah. yeah. What, what more? I mean, we've gone through it all. But the one yeah. thing is, I can tell you in the past, the Roonies don't cater to demands. Yeah. It doesn't happen. So I think what Ben meant is he wasn't going to throw five interceptions that's in a game that. anymore, Dave. I think that's what he was saying. No, I think he's I saying, he actually I'm said. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, I'm, 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 I'm joking. I'm joking. Yeah, he says, I, I think he, I've lost He it. absolutely yeah. did. I was trying yeah. to be, you know, <laughs> joking well, around there. I don't there. think he's going to throw five interceptions <laughs> in this game. So. He better not. <laughs> well, if he does, then I think Pittsburgh might be in trouble. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I... I I don't know. I, I have no idea what to make of Bell. I think Bell's fairly consistent in terms of being a little bit out there as far as his comments go. So I think it's an in one ear and out the other type of thing for a lot of his teammates and for me. Uh, and he's the key guy in this game, though, because you've got to run the ball in Jacksonville. Uh, if you have to rely on the pass against the Jaguars, you've got a lot of trouble because they are Saxonville in terms of rushing the passer, and they've got a really good secondary, and you'd better run the football. If you don't, you're going to end up doing what Buffalo did last week, which was nothing on offense. Uh, I mean, nothing. Okay? I mean, granted, they might have won the game had it not been for a stupid offensive pass sure. interference penalty. But uh, uh, the fact remains, they, w- they didn't get a lot of points in that game, and it had nothing to do with weather conditions or anything like that. They just got stuffed. So, yeah, that, that's how this game breaks down to me. Now, I do have a play in this game. It's, a str- it's my strongest play of the weekend, so I'm not going to talk about it beyond that. But I think that's, that's the key to the football game is the Steelers' running game. I'll tell you what, Jacksonville, they're great against the pass. They're bottom third against the run. They're 21st in the league, almost bottom third against the run. So they can be run on. And obviously the Pittsburgh offense, a few more tools than the Buffalo Bills possess to make it maybe a little bit easier to run the football. And with that said, in the first game, I don't know what Todd Haley was saying. Now, I realize in the fourth quarter they had to throw the football, but it was, I think, a 7-6 game at halftime. They weren't running the football against one of the worst rushing defenses in the league, and you got Le'Veon Bell in the backfield. I couldn't understand (laughs) that. And I got to ask you guys, I mean, you all watched the Buffalo game last week. The game plan for Jacksonville was, to me, it wasn't to win the football game. It was not to lose the game. They did not call any plays that put Blake Bortles in well, any type of— Do you blame him? He was so bad on those first-half passes. And I, we were talking about this. might have been on Mad Dog Radio. We were talking about the fact I was giving his receivers credit for not exploding and blowing up at Blake Bortles on the field because he was missing open his receivers is, left and right. job. Don't manage the pick. game and don't screw it up. Yeah. That's his that's he's not a look. Uh Eli Manning's gonna be the quarterback in Jacksonville next year. Yep. Hey, he is. He no, he is. He's probably gonna I, get two I, he seasons. Is. Yep. He'll go down there and he'll play for, he'll wrap is. up his career with Coughlin. This is the end for Bortles. He's not gonna be a, he, he will be a backup next year, which is what he is. Yeah. He's not gonna beat the Steelers with his feet. Well, that's a like thing. And, last, and, and what do you have? 87 yards passing and more yards running. Yeah, and 80, it was all 88 scrambles. to 87. Yeah. yeah, it was just ridiculous. Uh, I think he's 55% his last three games now, going back to the regular season. More interceptions, five, than touchdown passes thrown, three. That, that's, that's tough. Saints at Minnesota to wrap up the wild, uh, well, excuse well, me, the is, divisional this, round this weekend. Fun. This one was five and a half when we talked to Matt. Yep. It's down, it went down to five, dead number, but it went down to five at CGT since we talked to Matt on Thursday afternoon. Total was 46 and a half. I'm just going to throw it out there. I, I'm having a tough time getting over the Breeze experience winning a Super Bowl who's also having a terrific season against a guy who would have been a third-string quarterback yeah. if not for injuries. That doesn't mean that Minnesota doesn't come in here and win yeah. and cover. And but, Keenum, boy, that's tough to get over that. Keenum's become a good quarterback. I mean, it's, I don't think this is a fluke. I think this guy is a legit starting quarterback in the NFL now. His decision-making has been really good. How much weight do you put into the Saints' injuries? Because that, to me, is what... Uh, was the catalyst mm-hmm. for the line move. Is the Saints have good injury problems. Sure. This is not a good time of year to have injury problems. And the other team had the week off, and they're playing at home in a really good environment. I mean, that is a terrific home field. It's as loud there as anywhere. Yeah, it really is. It's, it's Seattle Midwest, if you want to call it yep. that. And uh, um, I don't know. I mean, this to me, this is the toughest of the four games because it, I, I do agree with what you said. Breeze has a, you know, who's nobody's going to, manage a game any better than Drew Brees, except maybe Tom Brady, and they're neck and neck as far as that goes. Mm-hmm. They've got a fabulous running back, and 
Then they've got the change of pace running back who can get you the short yardage and stuff like that, and a good pass catcher. They're just a really good football team, and the Saints play good defense, so they could force Minnesota mistakes. The flip side of it is, I think we've reached a point where if you're waiting for the other shoe to drop on Keenum and for uh, there to be some kind of a return to reality, it ain't going to happen. Well, this guy this is on a that. good on that, quarterback. On that particular statement, let me throw this at you. They, had, they played the Packers. This is late in the season. The Packers, the Bears, the Lions, well, obviously twice each, but also late in the season. Uh, the Bears have nice defensive numbers you know, on the surface. But the offense was so bad that things started to wear down for the Chicago Bears. So he did not, you know, that division was not exactly, no, you know, no. setting records with a defensive well, play. Ne- and he had Cincinnati's neither defense late right, this season. I'll throw this in. Then neither was New Orleans. But Tampa Drew Brees has been Tampa, there before. I know, I yeah, that's, Tampa, what that's my point. Tampa Bay's defense yeah. was atrocious. Sure. Uh, and, you know, it's not like the other teams. You know, right. Carol, Carolina, Carolina's is just, This is good. a huge step up in defense if oh, they're healthy yeah, yeah. for Case Keenum. I'm not trying to make an argument for them. I'm just saying, you know, that's what we got to throw into it. Yeah, he started to look like a real starting quarterback. He was facing teams that were out of the playoffs some, at the end of the season. He's got some great weapons around him, too, yeah. which will make you look like a great quarterback. Hell yeah. Diggs is a tremendous player. a great player. coaching staff. You know, the, the Jose <laughs> Altuve of running backs is a, is, is a great talent. Sure. Uh, what was it, McKinnon? Um, you know, the guy looks like he's 5'2 out there. <laughs> Boy, he is good. Really good. They, they, this is a great matchup. They won the first game of the uh, the first game of the season, right? Yep, For both yeah, Monday night week game. one, Minnesota wins twenty nine nineteen. Bradford, little at difference. Quarterback. Bradford at quarterback. Another little difference. Dalvin Cook, one hundred and twenty seven yards on twenty two carries. Their running backs with Dalvin Cook being out average about three point seven, three point eight yards per carry on the season. Yeah, the difference uh, about the Saints this year, and we talked about it was. Nobody saw the defense having the improvement that the Saints had this year, and we talked about it uh, numerous times. The main reason that this defense became better is the defense isn't on the field as much as it used to be. The Saints' offense was quick pace, go down the field before you know Drew Brees pass. You know they were passing the football around, mm-hmm. score a touchdown, and you know three-minute drives, and all of a sudden your defense is back out on the field and they were getting wore out. They had more balance this year because of that two-headed monster in the backfield with Kamara and Ingram. But, guys, I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but over the last five weeks, the uh, Saints running game has only topped 100 once, and that was against the Jets. Uh, The Falcons held them two weeks. uh, They played them twice down the stretch, Atlanta. They held them in check to 50 yards uh, one, the first meeting, and in the second meeting to 66 yards. Tampa Bay held them to 92. And Carolina last week in that playoff game, 41 yards. Mm-hmm. What's happening is it's shifting time of possession now that the Saints' defense is back on the field for more. And if you've looked, the last three weeks, you had Matt Ryan throw for 264, Jameis Winston threw for 345. And last week, as much as Cam Newton has been struggling, He threw for over 300 yards last week, too. And the thing that tells me uh, the big thing about the defense now uh, with the running game not working, last week when the game was on the line, and I know we can debate it, um, the math says it was a positive EV play going forward on fourth and two, but with the game on the line and you have the lead and you're playing at home and you're at midfield and it's a fourth and two, I'm punning. I'm mm-hmm. sorry. I'm I'm going to make the team go the whole With length the of the field. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That tells me Sean Payton had, had way more confidence in his offense to convert the fourth and two mm-hmm. that he risked putting the defense out to, mm-hmm. back out there at midfield with the game on the line. Uh, I like Minnesota here. Case Keenum, that is the only asterisk to it that keeps me from sure. snapping the rubber bands off uh, with this is how is he going to react his first playoff game. But this is a guy that's not, it's not like we're talking about Jared Goff that was in the league just two years. Mm-hmm. It's not, you know, the other guy, like a Blake Bortles and that, where we talk about quarterback. The guy's been around for a while. I mean, he's been, how many different teams moved around and he's played the entire season and he's played well. And what I like about it, if you remember when he actually started to play his best football of the season is when they, Put Sam Bradford on the IR and activated Teddy Bridgewater. Yeah. He had the guy on his shoulder, you know, looking over his shoulder, and there was never an issue of did he have to make, did Zimmer have to make a decision yeah. of who's going to quarterback? Yeah, Got to give Keenum a lot of credit for that. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, I like Minnesota here. They're going against 
one of the best defenses in the league in the Vikings. If the Saints have been having trouble running the football the last couple weeks, how much trouble are they going to have on the road in a dome against a team like Minnesota? And if they got to start throwing the football, yeah, uh, they can score their points, but the defense is going to be back out there quick. And you look at this secondary, I think they've only allowed one 300-yard passer all season long, and most of them are under 200. And I, I tell you again, I got to say it again. I love that Minnesota coaching staff. Yeah. I mean, they just, I still don't think they get enough credit. And they've also padded a few bankrolls. By the way, old school, get a money clip. You don't have to snap the rubber bands. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> you just like hear that noise. <laughs> yeah. I, quick little story. My, uh-huh. my stepdaughter. One of my gag gifts for Christmas uh-huh. got me a big bag of rubber bands. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's great. Wallet. That's <laughs> funny. <laughs> got me wallet. Did she put any money I in did. it? Yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't give me any money. I mean, it's like everybody knows I still go old school with the rubber I, band. I like the clip, but I get it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do that once in a while just to hear the snap. All right, guys, that's the NFL for the week. I love mm. wild card week and divisional round. Four games split over two days. I like it as much as the Super Bowl when it comes to this particular There's weekend. one big difference, though. We're not going to get the great food. That's true. Yeah. Well, we can go to Jay's or something like that over at uh, Fleming's well, Town saying, Square. You know, for the Super Bowl, I'll have the big buffet out and stuff like no, that. I got you. Know, yeah. 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 That's going to be good, true. man. That's true. <laughs> All right, guys. Let's take a, t- a quick time out. When we come back, college basketball. we got a huge card, including uh, three top 25 head-to-head matchups that we're going to talk about. Stick around. Every Tuesday, wagertalk.com offers a best bet selection from its hottest handicapper. It's a great way to introduce yourself to wagertalk.com with a big best bet winner for just $2 on $2 Tuesday. Welcome back to Wager Talk, a divisional round weekend podcast. If you missed any of it, go back and check it out. Don't forget videos this week at wagertalk.com. Marco and the gang cut a few videos with football, basketball, and golf. I'm going to guess included on the PGA and the welcome of Brady Cannon. I was going to say, yeah, Brady Cannon, a good friend of all of ours in this room, uh, is now a member of wagertalk.com. His golf expertise is as good as it gets in the Las Vegas Valley. Done a lot of radio shows with with Brady, and he was also part of a multi player team that won the Westgate Super Contest. It was 2011. Was it that long ago already? My gosh, six years ago. He was my former producer. Uh, at Brady? Sports Fan Radio Network. Brady? Yes. He, I had no he was, idea he was, he was in the a radio producer. business. No way. I didn't uh, know that. Until he decided that production people in the radio business don't make a great living and decided to smart open, open his own business, which was a <laughs> smart move. I had no idea he was with, uh, in radio. I didn't know. Other than yeah. the fact yeah. that he does a great job on the air. Yeah. We're going to try to get him to talk to him this week. We'll get him down here next week for the podcast and talk about the uh, conference championships in the NFL and all that good stuff. Uh, all right, let's get to basketball right. for the weekend. Uh, earlier today on uh, the Las Vegas Sports Line, Coke had mentioned there's like 9 or 10 million college basketball games mm. on Saturday. We've got to cap every single one of them. Well, we're going to get three out of the way right now. They're all top 25 matchups. TCU at Oklahoma. Uh, guys, I power rated this Oklahoma minus six, and, and that doesn't mean that's where the number is going to be. Marco made it six also as he <laughs> shows me on his notes. <laughs> let's start with you, sir, because you follow Jamie Dixon quite a bit. When he is at Pitt, there were some grumblings from some of the Pitt fans that, eh, do we want Jamie Dixon to stick around? He's not get, Be careful what you ask for. Jamie Dixon turning around the Texas, Texas Christian program in a hurry. He has. In, uh, he's changed his dynamic a little bit. He was always a uh, Jamie Dixon. We're looking at games in the 60s, yep. and uh, that's not the case, which he give him credit to adapt to the conference that he went to because it's not yep. a conference that plays that style. He's going to have to score points, and uh, you talk about scoring points. They shot in their last game, TCU, 55%. From three-point land <laughs> and lost in overtime. <laughs> How do you shoot 55% That was against and Texas, lose? right? Well, yeah. yeah. Look, I, and just, we'll, we'll mention that I, this was a game. I, the I Texas think, motivation. Boy, yeah, with a kid, yeah. you know, the kid being di- diagnosed with leukemia. Sure. And they just weren't going to lose that basketball game. And as, as it is, TCU missed a, lay, um, kid missed a layup. Yeah. Oh. And at the end of the double overtime, absolutely incredible game. What's the residual from that? For both the, teams. I mean, yeah. that was a tremendously emotional game. Sure. Going to Oklahoma, and they're going to have to score points again because, you know, Trey Young for Oklahoma. Oh, oh, my God. I mean, if there's one guy that I like to watch this, you know, this season of college basketball, it's him. He can do everything. And uh, I'm a little bit concerned in this one that TCU, if they can pick themselves up 
off the mat, off the double overtime loss, and go to Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. Um, this one, I'm I'm not saying it's going to be on my card on Saturday, but right now, if it does come around, the number that we, you and I projected, Adam, lean into the Oklahoma side. I think it might come a shade higher than that. Uh, and I, I'm thinking it might come seven or seven and a half. The reason to say, say that is I think the odds makers might put in a point for just how draining that game was against Texas on uh, on Wednesday night. And I, I, I think that does factor into it. Now, one interesting thing, and this is, alludes to a, the point you were making, you know, TCU is like number five in the nation in offensive efficiency. They're not in the top 100 defensively. Mm-hmm. That's a bit of a shortcoming for them because they are facing a really good offense in Oklahoma. And, as usual, Lon Kruger's teams... Pretty efficient at both ends of the court. You know, Kruger's just about as good as it gets. And this is one game where Jimmy Dixon doesn't have a coaching advantage because Lon sure. doesn't get out coached, particularly in Norman. This Oklahoma team is looking more and more like a team that's got that type of balance on the offensive and defensive end. That means they're going to be a Sweet 16 team, and when you get to the Sweet 16, anything can happen. So that, can, that means they, they could be sticking around on the final weekend of the year. And I think the spot favors Oklahoma as well. I wouldn't be surprised if Oklahoma wins this in the 9 or 10-point range. Have we mentioned Trey Young yet? <laughs> 30 points, wow. 10 assists per game. I'm hearing you know, a lot about him uh, come draft day. Oh, you know. my gosh. Trey Young, you know, I think what West Virginia, and we didn't see Texas Tech really copy this, but West Virginia kind of showed, you got to be very good, obviously, you got to have a lot of talent. But they kind of show what you got to do to beat Oklahoma. You don't worry so much about what Trey Young's numbers are. Right. You can't let other guys, you know, like Brady Manick, those kind of guys, uh, beat you. Um, so it's a situation of whether TCU, and you mentioned it, you know, do they have the defensive style of play that can do that, can copy what West Virginia was doing? Let Trey Young get 30 and 10, and don't let Christian James and Brady Manick and guys like that beat you. I'm not so sure TCU can do that. Were you done talking about the game, Marco? Yes, I wasn't I was. sure. Okay. It looked like you were going to say something else there. West Virginia, also in the Big 12 at. Texas Tech and the Texters. Well, I power rated them minus one in this one, and again, doesn't mean where the lines get, lines get Ryan, where the lines going to be. But uh, again, that's where I power rated it. Um, I make West Virginia about a two point to three point favorite on a neutral court, guys. Uh, Tech with home court advantage, I think, will be the short chalk. West Virginia beat Oklahoma recently. Tech fell by ten points short in Norman. But Dave, I'm going to be tempted to back the Red Raiders here. Uh, if it's that number, I'll be on them. Yeah. Uh, I think it's going to come higher than that. Um, I, I can see this game coming in the two or three range. I didn't check the Ken Palm ratings because oftentimes that's what the line is. Okay, this is re- this is what's really interesting to me in this game. Uh, when West Virginia has trouble, it's when the other team is just as good de- defensively as they are, because West Virginia doesn't create offense against good defenses. Well, Chris Beard. Coaches defense. He coached defense at Little Rock. Uh, the one week was he was here in Las Vegas, even though they never played. <laughs> I'm sure he was coaching defense, and uh, and he's done. So well, we were lucky enough. We got Marvin Menzies. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Smoke coming out of coaches. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's a heck of a recruiter. Anyway, uh-huh. Beard. <laughs> did, I like. I didn't what, we have a coach like that? It was a heck of a recruiter. Oh, yeah, yeah, we, yes, okay. yes, we did. Okay. <laughs> uh, I mentioned Texas Tech prior to the season when we were doing our uh, long shot show for the Final mm-hmm. Four. I threw Texas Tech in as, as mine uh, because this guy, he is an absolutely great basketball coach. Oh, yeah. And they are as fundamentally sound as any team you're going to find in the country right now. They don't have the most talent in the country. In fact, if you match up the talent. Position by position in this game, you're probably giving an edge to West Virginia in terms of national talent. But he's going to play enough defense to force West Virginia to have to create offensively, and they, they don't do that. Mm-hmm. And he's got an efficient offense that isn't prone to turning the ball over all that much. I don't think it's a good matchup for West Virginia. And if it's a power rating type line, I think I'm, there's a good chance I'll be on the Red Raiders come Saturday. I think it's good. I have a number three, three and a half for mm-hmm. me. And I think that if it is that, it's going to be a little tough for me to pull the trigger mm-hmm. on Texas Tech. But I'm like, Dave, I want to pull Maybe the trigger. I'm hoping for a one. Yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> hoping for it. Just to, for, I just to win the happen. game and you cover, basically. But you talk about defense in West Virginia. I mean, we know what they're going to do. It's the same every game. They're going to come at you with a pressure defense. They're going to create turnovers. In the last game, they held Baylor to 35% shooting in the game, and they forced 21 
turnovers. That formula is going to make you a winner all the time. Now, as you said, when you're going up against a team that can do it the same, um, not quite as efficient as West Virginia, but they're pretty darn close. Where I might be interested and see where this comes out at, what do they make the over-under on this game? Yeah. That's, I mean, this is going to be the race to 60 mm. in this game. Um, that's where I might get a little more creative because, you know, the Big 12, this is not the style of play that you see in most of the Big 12 games. So a lot of the games you see higher totals sure. if you look down the list of, you know, all their previous games. Now you put two teams that are st- – you know, like mirror images of one another. That's where I'm going to be looking. I lean to Texas Tech in this one, um, but I'm going to see where the total comes. If we're in that, you know, one, you know, if if I can get this under 126, you know, somewhere around there over, I might be looking at this one for the under. I love the top half of the Big East. We're not going to talk Georgetown, St. Mm-hmm. John's, or DePaul right now. We're talking Creighton and Xavier. <laughs> ah, boy. And uh, this, adds, this game adds Xavier. Blue Jays mm-hmm. back at the top 25. They always fall out. And then the next week, they're right back in, and they're never higher than 25th, it seems like, this season. Three-game winning streak for the Jays. I don't know, Marco. They look like they might be catching Xavier at the wrong time. The Muskies off back-to-back losses to Nova and Providence. Both of those were on the road. Xavier, a perfect 11-0 at home this season. Yeah, this is a team that's uh, going to definitely be focused coming off a beatdown. And fortunately for me, I was on Villanova. I just thought it was a matchup, mm-hmm. you know, Mismatch kind of they just don't line up well with Villanova and Villanova. Uh, they had a lot of turnovers and that right created a lot of turnovers last night and they were hitting their shots from outside and talk about not hitting shots from outside. Xavier put up 17 three pointers last night, they only hit three. Mm. Now, granted, they fell behind and they had to start forcing some, sure. and that never works whenever you're forcing the threes. But I think at home, I, it's a, a better one. Where are you putting this number? I have it at my power rating has it like six, six and a half. Seven is where so, I got mine. So yeah. we're, we're on par there. I thought it, I went a little bit less because I thought maybe the odds maker would take a little deduction after the beatdown last night at mm. uh, Villanova and Creighton having a big win uh, last night. But uh, this is a spot where I'm going to be on the home side. You know, uh, this will be a play for me this weekend. Yeah, I, I mean, it, I'd have to be way off on my number for it not to be. Yeah, this is a team plays good defense, and um, I like them here. I think they match up better in this game, uh, you know, against them than they did obviously against Villanova. I agree with with everything you guys said, but there's something not right with this crate with this uh, Xavier team. I, I can't at home. I, <laughs> They're eleven and zero. <laughs> no, and no, what a big. No, I, uh, I just have seen, and to me, it's not a home or away thing. I, I've just seen. It just doesn't seem like the on-court flow is what I'm used to seeing out of Xavier teams. It doesn't matter because it's only early January. Sure. And Chris Mack wants his team playing its best basketball at the end of the season, uh, so they can make another run in the NCAA tournament. So I'm not. This isn't a knock on on Xavier. I just don't think he's found the right combination yet. And I'm waiting for a buy sign on Xavier. Maybe it'll happen in this game. I won't be on it uh, because I want to see that buy sign. And I'm talking about a, a real buy sign. Would they just go out there and have one of those Xavier games and just beat the crap out of somebody, uh, usually at home? Mm-hmm. And it might be here because Creighton, uh, you know, Creighton can get phys- out physical, if you will. They don't have that big rim protector like they had last year no. with the freshman moving on to the NBA. So and I. Uh, but I've got to be convinced by Xavier. Right now, I've got them as a team that's got, you know, they've got the star next to them because there's a ton of potential there, obviously. But I'm waiting for Blewett to really put together a, a big run. He's, I know he's been dinged up here mm-hmm. and there. Uh, yeah, there was one game recently where, you know, he was clearly not right. When I see it, I'll probably start playing Xavier. But I, I want to see it first. Uh, in this game, you know, my power ratings are a little bit different uh, than the masses. I, I only get... Xavier about four. I'm God, if power ratings. four. But that, no, five percent made a big game of the my, year. My, <laughs> no, I understand. My, my power ratings are not are not what the line is. Sure. No, uh, of course. Yeah. They're actually they're actual yep. they're actual predictions on the games. Right. And that's one though where even you would take your chances if it was four though. I would guess with Xavier. Oh, if the line actually yeah. came four, yeah. yeah. I mean, just on value, to. I'd go yeah. for it because uh, it's going to come more than that. Sure. I think you probably look at an eight in that range because you know Xavier is a known commodity. I think that the odds makers will factor in. The two losses in succession, and, and I think that they're going to make you pay a price for the Musketeers here. Uh, so eight might be a little bit steep, 
maybe maybe it does come seven in that range, like you guys said. But uh, uh, but I, I don't like going against my power ratings. I just I use them to keep me off games as much as anything else. That's what happens to me a lot? There's more games that I don't play because right. of my power ratings that I do play, and I think any decent better worth his weight in salt is going to say the same thing. You know, you, you stay off of more with your power ratings than you play on because of your power ratings. Mm-hmm. Good stuff, guys. Uh, can't wait till Saturday's card. I can't wait till I'm done handicapping Saturday's card because I'm going to probably be working on the card for about 12 hours on Friday <laughs> with all those games that are taking place on Saturday. When we come back, best bets. Stick around. Welcome back to Wager Talk. It's best bet time, and we're going to... You know what? I want to start again with what's going on at Wager Talk before we get Dave's best bet. So, Marco, fill us in. You talked a little bit briefly about Brady Cannon. We're going to invite him to come on down to the podcast next week uh, when we talk about the conference championships. But uh, what's going on at Wager Talk this weekend? Well, if you want uh, even more uh, talk about the playoff games, we did videos on all four games, so you can get uh, Sports Cheetah and Ralph Michaels' view on all four games. Check out the uh, daily NBA uh, stat sheet that Ralph Michaels does. Great stuff. I mean, mm-hmm. if you're handicapping the NBA, it's a quick one pay. You get everything you need right in one download. It's free. Go to the site every morning. Get a cup of coffee. Download it. Read it. You're set to go. Uh, and then always check out the specials we got. And I'll tell you what, this time of the year, with the playoffs and basketball Saturdays, the three day and seven day all access packages, great mm-hmm. deals. You can get three days for fifty nine dollars. Pick your favorite capper. You're going to get every play they have. You got multiple plays on Saturday with all of the college basketball, NBA going, and of course the playoffs. So check it out at wagertalk.com. Good stuff. Let's go to Dave Koken at Dave Koken. I think you said you know, did you have a five percent in the I NFL do. this week, right? Yeah, I've got okay. one. Uh, as we're recording this, uh-huh. I have one in progress that uh, at least is off to a good start. Uh, thir- I think it's thirteen and four in the last seventeen games nice. of the week. Uh, and a uh, really easy winner. It was more information than handicapping, but, you know, it wasn't inside. I don't want to make, make it clear it wasn't inside information, uh, but the information out there in Minnesota, uh, Gophers, the Golden oh, Gophers. We've talked about it on the show, the radio show, yeah. Hugely negative information, and I took advantage of that and made Northwestern a really big play. Interesting Wednesday to night. see what happens to that team. I mean, there's a yeah. lot of guys, including myself, yep. that jumped on a future before the season began on uh, Minnesota for yeah. hedgeability reasons, but with this deal with Lynch, third woman coming out and accusing him. And two of them sexual he's assault. Been found at fault in two yeah. of those. And for Richard Petino to not learn from his father, well, look, look, he had him in practice on Monday. And the comment. Oh, the comment. Yeah. Somebody asks him about it and he says, well, I'm only concerned with how the team performs or something along yeah. the way. What? Uh, this team looked like they're going they to be feeling this for a while. At Northwestern. Yeah. Yep. Uh, they got killed in that game. I mean, Northwestern got bored in the second half when they were up 28. And, uh, in fact, there was one instance where uh, Skelly goes in for a dunk, and he misses the dunk, and he knew he was gonna, this was going to happen. He grabs the rim with the hand that he was yeah. trying to dunk with, catches the ball with the other hand, and slams it through. Well, that's technical. a technical. Like, <laughs> it's like a seven-point swing. Uh, looks they they might have won the game by 35. <laughs> anyway, the, the, five star, the 5% play has been great. And I've got one in, in the NFL this weekend, and I'm, I, I think there's a good chance I'll have another one in college basketball on Saturday. So you want to get those games, the all-access, get your games that I don't sell. Mm-hmm. They're personal service plays that I'm putting uh, on Wager Talk. And th- these, are, these are tremendously important plays because they are personal service plays. I might not always include the analysis, but Wager Talk is going to have those games uh, regardless. So if you buy an all-access pa- uh, all pass, you will uh, have those all plays. those games. <laughs> I don't work your magic, buddy. Uh, <laughs> okay, and uh, as far as the best bet goes, my cup. <laughs> we talked. Uh, we talked about this. This game. Uh, I. I just think this is a really good spot for Texas Tech. I like the matchup against West Virginia. We'll see what they do with the number as to whether it actually makes the card or not. But it's definitely a game. I'm. I've got a big circle on as a potential play on Saturday. Texas Tech minus hopefully a small number at home against West Virginia. Mr. D'Angelo. Oh, by uh, the way, at Dave Koken, you're at Marco in Vegas. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to follow yourself. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to go to the Minnesota um, play that we talked about uh, in the NFL. To me, the Vikings here, it concerns me about the running game. I won't go into great detail because we talked about it already. 
But four of the last five weeks, they haven't been able to run the football, the Saints. And I think that's the key, especially against the defense as good as the Vikings. They're rested. Combine the injuries. Unless Case Keenum goes out there and has a horrible game, I like the Vikings here. I'm going to lay the points. I think they win by 10 here at home. And we didn't mention it when we talked about it. The Vikings have a chance to make history, be the first team ever mm. to have a home game in a Super sure. Bowl. It, you know, There's been some in the same state, but never yeah. in the same. It, yeah. it'd be a, the interesting thing is if the Patriots are playing them, they'll still be a home dog. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. They will. You're right. Yep. Well, we'll have another first. We've, we've got a number yeah. one seed as a home dog in a, the playoffs, and we'll have a home I mean, Stanford, dog in the Super Stanford Bowl. Has, I mean, Stanford, jeez. Uh, the San Francisco <laughs> hey, 49ers the, played in Northern it? California, but not yeah. in their home stadium, or played yeah. in California. Uh, and there have been, I think the Rams played back, it was a Vince Ferragamo, is that when they played in the state of California, but it wasn't in their home wasn't it at they the Rose Bowl, the not the Coliseum? Yeah, wasn't yes, it against it was the Steelers? Paragon right. was 31-19 year. final. Yep. 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 Ray Malavesi, uh, extra That's right. point miss, yep. cost me the win. I had, <laughs> I had the Rams plus the points in the game. Uh, uh, I forget who the kicker was, but Malavesi was the... Uh, Were you hmm. nervous in that game, Marco, as a Pittsburgh fan, or did you think they had it all the way? Be honest. I was um, I was rooting for Ferragamo, of course, a Nebraska boy. Well, it's <laughs> it's funny that you you said that that you lost it because um, I got an extra half a point and I had the Rams because I was playing with a, a local in Pittsburgh ah. and you know remember the good old days way back in you know when you could get you know if you had contacts obviously you know if you're betting the Giants games you know you get a New York out and so forth and that but being it was a Super Bowl involving the Steelers we had to pay a price for it yeah. I took the value, and I was <laughs> I was sweating to hang on for the cover. <laughs> I would have won that game. It was a missed extra point, and also yep. I think Nolan Cromwell took an interception. It was a pick. I six think you're right. Yeah. Nolan Cromwell, and it yep. got taken off the board because of a dumbass Seems holding like I penalty that. <laughs> after after the return the interception. And uh, I'm still pissed. <laughs> Think Always goal. remember the past. Oh, yeah. you know yeah, yeah. We, had those, we had those layoffs. You know, growing up in Omaha, you had your yeah. layoff in, in in Kansas City, but they got sharp to the fact in Kansas City that okay, let's say Nebraska's pick them at home against Oklahoma. Well, they're minus seven at Omaha, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so you go to Kansas well, City listen, and you only have to lay wait, one. Well, yeah. <laughs> and by the way, with a local, chances are they juice the line. Uh, and and make you pay six to five on basically. Top of that. I'm yes. telling you, that's had, what, I got listen. I I. I I was a book. Yeah. Okay. And if I, but I, I oh, they're going to they're gonna be at the Patriots, the Giants, whatever. Yeah. I'm not uh, going to say extra, his name because points, he's still around. Extra point six to five. My, my they dad, do it anyway. My dad was an engineer with Burlington Northern, and they were all betting and everything else, like, you know, everybody does in the Midwest and playing Sputnik. Did you ever play the game Sputnik cards? No. Okay. There was a game in the Midwest called Sputnik, and of course, uh, a Euchre used to sit there and play Euchre. You probably know Euchre from yeah. the Pittsburgh area. But they named um, the game after Bob Euchre? Yes, they did. Push <laughs> 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 me in the front row. But uh, anyway, Buffalo Butt was the bookie's name. That's E-U-C-H-R-E. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> and Buffalo Butt was like the only guy who hadn't been hit lately in town. I can't say his real name, but that's what they call him, Buffalo yeah. Butt. He seemed to be proud of it, so there you go. But uh, you could never get a pick'em game with him. It was minus one on both teams, <laughs> yes. no matter what. Yes. Did you get that Remember too? That too? Yeah. 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 It was yeah. minus yeah. one on both teams. There was never a pick'em game. Right. But if Nebraska was a pick'em game, they were six or seven with good old <laughs> Buffalo butt. Um, anyway. My uh, first bookie's <laughs> name was Worm. Worm? Worm. <laughs> I think owned, I saw him in the poker movie with yeah, uh, Matt yeah, Damon. He owned, a, he, owned a, he owned the bar. You'd, you'd go into the bar and make the bets. How come they never had, like, classy-sounding names, those guys? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Buffalo butt. Anyway, <laughs> he's a Marco in Vegas. He's at Dave Coke, and I'm at Scott Wins. I've got a 5% up right now in the NFL also, and I, there's no doubt in my mind I've got like four games earmarked that could be a 5% play. One of them will be in Saturday's college baskets. Last Saturday was real nice. We hit with Hawaii late, and they were never in doubt. They won by like 19 on the mainland. And uh, that game took us to 4-0-1 over the last five weeks with those 5% plays. That's what's going to be up this weekend. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because Dave just told you who he likes. I'm on the same side. We analyzed the game earlier. Texas Tech at home over West Virginia. My best bet. Wish everybody best of luck this weekend. Put your bets in the win column. We'll be right back here next Thursday and see if we get Brady Cannon in here with us as we analyze the conference championships for Dave Koken, for Marco D'Angelo, for Mark Seidel at the controls. I'm Scott Sprite, so we'll talk to you next week. And I bet you good night. Good night.
Good night. I'll catch you on the flip side.